welcome to our podcast. So this week we're going to be talking all things AI again. This is the third in a series of uh, three podcasts heading up to our annual conference, which is on the topic of AI that we wanted to put out just to warm people up and get us in the right mindset for our annual conference. Now, today I'm joined by Lawrence Rowland. Uh, welcome, Lawrence. Hi. Okay. Nice to see you again. Yeah, and Lawrence and I had a chat uh, a year ago, or just coming up to a year ago, on the back of a release of an update uh, by OpenAI of their ChatGPT platform. And we discussed a lot of things about um, ChatGPT in particular, but AI in general and the application of projects. And the sort of things we covered um, was, first of all, we did a bit of a, a jargon buster uh, layperson's intro. So I tried to explain things as I understood it, and then Lawrence corrected me and uh, and, and between that, we sort of got to a, a good understanding of some of these terms and concepts and ideas. And then we went through some examples that Lawrence has been working on. So uh, for those who uh, didn't listen to the podcast last time or haven't come across uh, Lawrence's experimentations on, on LinkedIn, uh, Lawrence committed to doing a post once per week on LinkedIn, exploring how AI could be used in the world of projects. Uh, and I'm pleased to say he's actually way over delivering. I've, I've gone sort of through some numbers and it's a lot more frequent than, than one per week. And it's, it's a brilliant way because it's really contextual and you can see how these things work. But we looked at a couple of your experimentations a year ago, Lawrence, about um, uh, examples of a refurbishment project of a, of a cottage just uh, based upon a, a photo that you had taken or provided to, to, the, to the model uh, and a railway project, a hypothetical one from sort of London to somewhere in the Midlands and then further north and it sort of gave you the steps as to what sort of things you need to do including things like well you probably need a hybrid bill and so on so it was brilliant we looked at other aspects around the degree of domain uh, knowledge that would be required by the models to help us sort of security and sensitivity the outputs and, and so on so if you've not uh, listened to that podcast I would recommend you going back over it because although it's a year ago some of these basic terms and concepts are useful. We're not really going to repeat uh, some of those today. At the end of that uh, podcast, uh, nearly a year ago, uh, we did a rating, and I asked you, uh, Lawrence, you know, how how could we rate um, ChatGPT if it was uh, if we gave it a, a persona or name and it was someone in our office? And at the time, you said it was sort of a, an enthusiastic undergrad or an intern was sort of the level it got to. And on the back of that, we said, well, why don't we come back a year later, where we are now, or almost a year later, and we'll have another test to see uh, how it's moved on. But this time, um, we're also hot off the heels of a, of a release. So uh, OpenAI has just released uh, OpenAI Omni One, I believe, or, yeah. or O1. But, uh, uh, it's O1. O one is the new, O1. yeah, yeah. It's so, a bit confusing because they had a four zero like a couple of months ago, and now they've changed their mind, and and the new mod class of models will start with O, and it'll be O one, O two, O three, etc. Um, right, so, stra okay. strawberry, St uh, strawberry is another way of referring to it. Uh, yeah. for, well, <laughs> let's come on to that in a moment because I think that's quite a useful thing for us to to just unpick what what <laughs> versions we we'll be talking about in in a moment, and um, but it's also uh, this week hot off the heels of um, CFAX having its 50th anniversary. <laughs> and, well, there'll be many listeners to this podcast who are saying, what's that? What's CFAX? <laughs> most, because, most listeners, uh, Andy. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but, but for those who have never heard or seen CFAX, it was something you could get on your TV. Uh, so it was a data service that <laughs> was uh, a receive-only uh, uh, broadcast, uh, and you put in page numbers. So I remember vividly <laughs> page 300 was sport. <laughs> Uh, 101 was headline news, uh, 400 was flights if you wanted to get cheap flights and so on. Uh, and you got these things a page at a time and it was inherently slow, but it was sort of the precursor to, to browsing. You know, so whereas you put into Yahoo, Google, Chrome, whatever that you're using to, to do your searching, it was what we had, you know, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, before the sort of browsers took over. And here we are uh, moving on from browsers, really, because, again, Chrome now, when you search for something, it doesn't just give you the return of what it's found. It will actually give you an AI prompt as well as to what's meant by those things that come up in your, your search results. So I think it's quite timely that uh, one year on from our chat, Lawrence, or nearly one year on from our chat, uh, we've got a number of things that perhaps we can explore that have been updated 
since. So I'm going to come back to the um, the question that I finished with last time round, which was um, if you were to give a rating as to how mm -hmm. good ChatGPT is, you said an enthusiastic undergrad or intern. Uh, a year on, a hell of a lot has changed, which we'll come on to in a moment. But how do you rate it now, Lawrence? Is it is it still a has it gone from undergrad to a graduate? Um, well, or are we moving on the journey to a trusted advisor? Oh, well, we're not there yet. Um, okay. This so first thing to say is is there's a lot more benchmarks now even than there were a year ago. So we could actually do a structured answer to that question. Um, so there's benchmarks for everything you care about. Sadly not for project management yet. So maybe that's something the, the community could community could look at at a certain point but um yeah i remember remember talking about that and actually i think so two weeks ago or three weeks ago and yeah I'd, I'd have given you one answer which would be my overall impression from the last 50 weeks or 40 weeks however long it is since we talked uh, but in the last two weeks there's a new answer so I, i'm gonna <laughs> have to give you two i'm afraid so what i'd have said two weeks ago is how it's changed since our last podcast is it's still a kind of enthusiastic grad that kind of gets things wrong. Um, uh, and I'd have said, that hasn't really changed. It's mm -hmm. got better. Um, so it's got a few more weeks experience. But what I would have said, the change I've noticed is it's almost like there are, you've now, <laughs> not to stretch it too far, but it's like there are cousins now of that enthusiastic grad in the, in the workplace, all with slightly different styles and temperaments. Um, and I think that's because the other models have caught up with GPT-4, okay? So sort of, if you if you like, the Google one and the Anthropic one uh, and also the open source ones, they all have different sort of styles and temperaments and, and strengths. Uh, and, and so that would have been my answer two weeks ago. It's still at the same general level of capability, um, but there's far more options to how to interact. Now, the O1... Uh, the model that came out is called the reasoning model or, or Project Strawberry. Um, people refer to it as different things. But O1 came out two weeks ago, and it's really very impressive because it gives you a chain of thought that it summarizes as well as the answer. Um, so it's comp and it's really really impressive. So I think the answer the answer for the last two weeks is what I would is is Terence Tao, who's a really famous mathematician. Um, who, who's been doing a lot of its sort of experiments um, himself. And he says, he says before, he says that it was like basically an incompetent graduate student. So he's thinking of sort of PhD type, type level. He's saying basically it was like a, like a really bad graduate student a year ago. Right. And he says now it's like a mediocre <laughs> graduate student who you can kind of help and like sort of can sometimes get along the path. So, so for a high level mathematician, that's kind of sort, sort of faint praise. But for the rest of us, um, that's already a pretty high bar. So, so it's like a it's like a kind of mediocre graduate student now um, in in the academic domain, and, yeah. and that's how it feels. That's how it feels. And that's sort of a description from incompetent to mediocre. And I guess that's not a that's not a question of education level that's really about application and being able to apply that knowledge uh, that that's been built up through you know through education rather than through training or, or practice so i think that's perhaps a, a useful one but there's a number of things to unpick in your uh, or to explore further in your your answers so so the the first one right at the beginning i, I mentioned the, the different um, labels so so if I try to explain it, and you can then correct me if I'm wrong like we did yeah. last time, but we had, so OpenAI is one of the providers, the, the biggie, if you like, that, that first came to market with a generative AI platform. And by generative AI, we mean something that produces output rather than just returns results from, from things. So, um, and it had versions and it released its chat GPT four. Um, yeah. Uh, and then it uh, added the Omni, the or Omni, and the Omni being that it had multiple ways that you could interact with it. So you could provide yeah. it with pictures, you could provide it with documents, you could provide it with videos, audio, or you could speak to it or type with it. So the Omni was about the what we call the multimodal aspect. Yeah. Um, and now we've gone to O1, which I thought was Omni1, but you said, no, it's just O. Um, yeah, it's so it's so, so so yeah. So broadly, so since we talked, so we we talked just um, for example as like the GPTs 
would be uh, you could create custom GPTs in November, um, uh, all based upon with a with a core model of GPT four underneath it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and since then, um, you've had you've had basically a GPT four uh, turbo, uh, which we had, which was like a more powerful model in the same genre. And then in like sort of March, April, OpenAI basically fumbled out. <laughs> Uh, it, in order to be in order to be Google, they fumbled out a multimodal offering that's really impressive. Um, but then, so there are different elements of it. They're still they're still um, sort of uh, sort of rolling out quite slowly. Um, uh, but basically, you can talk to it. It natively understands pictures um, uh, and figures alongside uh, both speech and the written word, um, uh, both in terms of input and output. Um, so that, that's really powerful. Um, now, then what happened like sort of two or three weeks ago, we've been waiting for GPT-5, uh, and that's still out there in the offing. Um, uh, there are some, some uh, you have to watch Sam Altman's tweets, uh, and like he was sort of musing about strawberries like a few months ago, and that was this, uh, this O1 model. Uh, we'll, we'll explain what, uh, what, why that is in a minute. Um, but that now uh, he's actually sort of musing about the night sky and, and Orion could be GPT-5. And they've got a big announcement at the end of October. Um, so there may just be incremental developments there. We, we don't know, or there may be something something more. But uh, O1, the reason why they seem to have like started their classification scheme um, uh, uh all over again, which, by the way, should feel very comfortable to sort of project manager um, sort of viewers and listeners. We do like our classification schemes, and we do know sometimes we need to do a meta a meta reordering and a, a, and change how we do it. So they, the, the O is for, for OpenAI, and one indicates that this is a new class of model because uh, it's the first in this one. Uh, and the reason why to pay attention to this is because um, it's no longer just an LLM. Okay, it's no longer just a large language model. What they've done is, if you think, uh, is essentially they brought a reasoning component, um, which they've done by essentially merging with another another technology that was in parallel to LLMs, um, which uh, uh, which is essentially we don't know exactly the detail of it, but it essentially explores multiple uh, answers at the same time and then chooses the best. So, like, it could be a Monte Carlo tree search, for example, and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But basically, the the model um, and, it, and the details they haven't shared many of the details. Even though the, there's a system card you can read, it's sort of forty pages you can read, but it doesn't tell you the architecture. But it's something along the lines of that the, the, the model can plan, and it, it can then choose the best path. So it doesn't. It's less likely to get stuck if you like in a in a cul de sac. Okay, so it's a reasoning model, and that's and uh, the sort of closest parallels that a lot of people will know was all of the Google stuff in like 2016, 17, 18, which seems a long time ago now, but was still really powerful. It was all of the AlphaGo um, and the, and the Alpha Chess implementations, uh, and like sort of Alpha Zero, which was essentially this sort of structured Monte Carlo tree search. Um, reinforcement learning is another word that's, that gets associated with this. Uh, and they also was they had some amazing work in terms of understanding things like uh, science, like um, like the sort of the shape of molecules and that kind of thing. Though, so LLMs and um, and Monte Carlo tree search and reinforcement learning kind of diverged for a few years, and and we all got excited about LLMs, but now they've if you like doubled the power because they brought back this this other technology, and that's why they've reset the the counter to model one. Okay, that's right. great for this different class. So we're probably going to be talking about classes of, uh, uh, of generative AI in, in, you know, as, as we progress. Um, you talk about that sort of um, that reasoning bit, and I've, I've heard the term sort of it's chat with reasoning uh, sort of uh, pop up on sort of uh, various sort of social media platforms as people are uh, exploring and experimenting with um, uh, open AI's O one, um, and one of the things it does, uh, and there are some examples. We'll put uh, some links to Lawrence's experimentations in in the show notes. But it provides the chain of thought summary. So when you get your answer, you're not just given an answer. It, 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 if you wish, you can see how it arrives at the answer. Now, is that a gimmick, 
uh, is it just sort of helping us give confidence or is it a bit, bit sort of yeah. a marketing thing about sort of, you know, great question. We were worried about hallucinations before. Well, this chain of thought summary is helping us understand the likelihood of the answer being a hallucination or not. Yeah, um, let's let, I'll leave the hallucination to one side. It does make hallucinations less likely, um, but it doesn't withdraw it. But like they're using reasoning as a catch all kind of phrase, partly because they're not telling us the architecture. Basically, because they've, they're, they've introduced this reinforcement learning. Um, and then it's allowing a lot more branching of, of basically of which routes they choose, of which route the model chooses. And it's allowing the model to, if you like, get ahead of that by thinking about which is the greatest value of the path to go down. Mm-hmm. Whereas what the LLM has been doing previously is like be, it's a, you know, what's called an autoregressive model. So it like it will, you know, spit out 100 characters. It will look at those 100 characters and then it will keep going down that track. Of what the most likely next, you know, sort of uh, yeah, it was like a statistics is. type engine, wasn't it? Behind the, you know, the the, the most likely yeah. next character, next word, and, and so on. So, yeah, help to plan ahead. Um, it, I think the plan ahead is 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 the right way of thinking. So, for example, if you think about it as being there's something called good old fashioned AI, if you like, which was was big in the sort of seventies, eighties, and nineties, and it's all sort of um, sort of expert systems. Uh, and it's all using first and second order um, uh, logics. Um, it's not that, right? So it's not reasoning in the sense of like sort of guaranteed guaranteed results from guaranteed premises. Um, what it is, is it's it's like it can associate, if you like, a value or a benefit with any given path. Um, uh, and it's that's it's much more like us in that way in that we go, ah, yeah, we don't want to go that route because we, we tried it four times in the past. Uh, and that route doesn't get us anywhere good. Um, yeah, and that's what we look- use analogies, isn't it? So we're, all we're doing there is is comparing one idea with another and, and seeing if there's perhaps a, a link or or a, or a usefulness of making that path from one idea to another idea. Is, is that sort of what it's doing so, too? So analog- it could potentially be better at analogical reasoning. Um, so bringing in things, that's an interesting thing. I, um, I, I don't know for sure. Um what I will say is when you when you use it, um, it, it does feel a lot more powerful. The answers are much more powerful. And, and mm-hmm. like then sort of turning to actually how you experience it, which is probably which you started the question with, I should probably turn to that. Because it's easy to miss it when you use it. Now, unfortunately, you have to pay for this new model. So you have to be on the so some people won't have seen it. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about sort of how it feels when you see the model. So uh, so it's an O1 preview, and if you're not paying, if you're paying the subscription, you can see it, um, and it gives you an answer, same as normal. Um, but at the top of the answer, the, it gives you a little summary of saying what it's doing at any given time. So it's it's it, it's basically think of it as being like this graduate, <laughs> this this intern, if you like, saying, right, I'm going to create a strategy, and then I'm going to sort of do a cost benefit, and then I'm going to prepare a table of contents, and then I'm going to review. That's the kind of thing it says. Now, mm-hmm. it's a little bit irritating um, because, again, that's a chain of thought summary. So, so the chain of thought, um, um, it's not, you're not seeing all of it. Um, but mm-hmm. that's, that's a quibble, right? That's, that's a quibble okay, that, so that you don't know what's hidden in there. Sorry? So it's a summary of its chain of thought. Then. Summary. So, so yeah. yeah. And so, for example, if, if it had a full details of the chain of thought, you, you, in theory, you could validate whether you're happy with that chain of thought, right? So you could say... So you could actually almost say, well, actually, if it followed that reasoning and that and that chain of thought was actually what it actually did do, um, then I could be happy with it because it did these validations and that kind of thing. And that's not what you're getting. But you could imagine that's what you're getting because it's essentially doing a summary. So it's not quite good enough for you to sort of say, yep, I'll be happy with the answer because it's given me this summary. It's like it's like it's like. Um, this graduate student coming back into you and saying, look, here are the results. Here's my 30 page recommendation. And these are the five steps I went through to get to it. And those five steps sound pretty good. And they're the sort of thing that you would have done. But you also know that the devil's in the detail. right? So, so you can't click down. You can't click down and see like, ah, oh, yeah, it, it exactly use this, you know, this function to to decide on this, etc. But it's a massive leap forward. And, and it feels much more powerful. Now, Another couple of things to say about it. Um, uh, firstly, it's O1 preview, 
So one of the things, um, so as they often do for safety reasons, if you like, and also for server reasons, um, they, they're holding back the, the, the full model. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but for us, it still feels like a really big model. Okay. So O1, for example, probably will be, um, uh, you don't know for sure, but probably at the developer day at the end of October will be announced. So actually that, that will be things. So, um, but the, even the O1 preview is very powerful. Um, and then the other thing is, is because obviously, um, they're still getting things of it to work. It's got less user interface functionality than the other models. So um, uh, now we've all got used to using the code interpreter, which is a data analysis with the 4.0 model. We've got used mm-hmm. to adding files. We've got used to um, uh, being able to talk, you know, get images in or out, uh, and all. And we've been used to to browsing. Now those things have temporarily been taken off for the O1 model because it's a preview. Mm-hmm. So. So, but uh, but those will for two things. Firstly, those will get added back in as if you like they're they're confident of the of the safety issues around around it, and also as uh, as they are more confident in their ability to deliver this at scale with the numbers of people demanding it. Um, and they've also released a mini model, okay, um, which oddly enough is better at, um, at sort of STEM at maths and science than the than the main model. So that's it's called O1 tuned, Mini. Uh, Sorry, it's sort of more highly tuned for exactly. It's it's, it's it's probably what they called as a stilled model. So they've, mm-hmm. if you like, trained it on the uh, on the O1 main model, um, but they've taken out lots of extraneous sort of um, uh, data. So it's got less world knowledge. Okay, but that's meant that they it's if you like better. <laughs> oddly enough, at, it's getting higher marks on like um, you know physics papers and things like that mm-hmm. and maths papers. Um, so you can use O1 Mini um, as well, and sometimes that's useful. And the and the really good thing is now um, is that you is that while we're waiting for the main model, the full model, um, essentially what you could do is, and what you should do is for for something that's requiring reasoning, like writing a um, you know one of my examples that I did was a, a project execution strategy for something. Um, You're like come to that in, in a moment. Oh, sorry. Because, okay. Well, okay. No, but, it's, 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 I want to just finish off the. Yes. Obviously, what we've been talking about so far is nothing unique to the world of projects. So this is um, correct. Yeah. So it's what's happening out there generally. Um, you know, in hundreds, thousands of different domains, people will be thinking about how we can use um, uh, O1 and O1 Mini. If I've got that right. Yes, um, exactly right. In, yeah. in, in yeah. what what they're doing. So uh, before we move on to then how do we apply it in a major projects context, which you were just give an example of the project execution strategy, which I want to come on to next. Yeah. So then my last question on the uh, or, or musings around the the general stuff. We've got these different classes. We've got sort of O1 and O1 preview. Hopefully, we'll have the O1 full model at some point and the O1 yeah. mini. Are there different sort of tariffs for this? Is, do they cost yeah. different amounts of money? So, so basically, at the moment, that it's capped. Usage is capped. Um, at, I mean, they they keep on increasing it, but you know, it's like of the order of a few hundred prompts a week at the moment, that kind of thing for for the O1 preview. Uh, and there's a higher cap for the O1 mini. Um, and actually, that's fine because you can still like use. Um, uh, and this is all assuming that you're you're a paid you're a paid person. Um, you can still use 4.0, uh, which is the uh, the multimodal model, and it's still like really powerful. And you should should be using that for some things, and that's not capped. And you also for some for some things you still use for uh, GPC four turbo. Okay, um, and and the, and one of the really good things is is that you can. Uh, in within one conversation now, it's much easier because I used to have to like do work in one model and then copy and paste the output into it and start mm-hmm. off with a new model if I wanted to change model midstream. Now, uh, all you do is you click down and you um, say you're working in 01, which you should probably start with working in 01. Uh, oh, hang on, I'm doing it now. No, it is right. It is 01. It is, it is, it is, it, honestly, it's hell, this naming schemes. Um and then let's say you need web browsing and uh, you need to work on the details of a document once O1 has set out the, the general principles, you should move across to 4.0. And you can just right. click on a thing and that's unlimited. So, so these old models, if I want to call them old, but the, 
the, yeah, the models legacy, we've been using yeah. previously yeah. Uh, are still available to us, so they're not yes. disappearing. We just get yeah. in these yes. these uh, additional models that and we what, can and, use. And what will happen is uh, that O1 will will in time uh, sort of pick up all of those extraneous things that were really good with in four zero like mm. browsing and data analytics and probably the multimodal and that kind of, I mean, it is a multimodal model. It's just you haven't got any any ability to input and output with uh, with it. Okay, right. So let's make that shift then from the general world of uh, um, AI and, and the sort of open AI platforms specifically to um, you know, its use in, in major projects. Now, ahead of today's uh, um, conversation, Lawrence, I... I contact you and say, can you just give me a quick summary of all the things you played with and done uh, <laughs> since our last call? And um, you sent me a Word document of uh, of links to your LinkedIn posts, and it came to twenty two pages. <laughs> of, of, can I, of, can I uh, apologise <laughs> publicly about? I mean, just just preface it a little bit. Given is is under pressure of time. I I would normally have sent you a page summarising it, but you know we were under a tight thing, and I'm yeah. sorry you just had to get the whole lot. I could, <laughs> but I think it was very illustrative of how prolific you've been uh, since our last yeah. call on just doing these experimentations. And I'm not going to have time really to. Um, ask you about all of them clearly sure. but but I've sort of been through them and I, there's a there's a number I thought would be useful for us to delve into so you can give some examples of how you're using it your thought processes uh, the results you got uh, and then again we will include links to those uh, in the show notes so people can go and look for themselves so the first one I want to pick up on is that you mentioned it before about the project execution strategy yeah. um, and you you wanted I think you used O one to, to help you with uh, what what would be a good uh, project execution strategy, you then either carried on using it or switched to four, but you then provided a project definition document, uh, and, and then you got it to generate a project execution strategy for you based upon that, yeah. that definition. So just explain to us how how that you know practically what you need to do to do that, yeah. uh, and then let's then discuss sort of you know how good it was, what came from yeah. it. And I think this is all about. I mean, this is not saying obviously you're you're uh, outsourced now to to your LLM to write your project strategy. This is all testing, right? Um, uh, it's like mm-hmm. as Ethan Mollick says, who you should be following if if you're not. Um, he says always like have LLM and LLM at the table, if you like, mm-hmm. on a conversation because it's it's got as he calls it a jagged edge. There's a jagged edge of capability. So in other words, the predict like. On a given thing you need it to do, it's unpredictable whether it will be able to do it or not. But it will very often surprise you in the positive and sometimes mm-hmm. will surprise you in the negative. So with something like this, it's like um, uh, all you need to do is you take a project definition document. I created a random one, uh, if you like, so I wanted to get outside my my normal sector, my comfort zone, because I wanted to see how well it would do. And uh, so you just put in a PDD and you give it to this reasoning model, this O1, and then you say, I'd like you to think through an execution strategy. Um, and then again, um, if you look at if you look in the post, then you see the whole sort of chain of thought that it goes through and you also see the output. So that's very, very quick and straightforward. Um, what you then would normally do is you'd normally engage with it and say, I want more on this and, and less on this. All I did for simplicity was two things. I, I, I firstly asked it to develop the second layer if you like, so it had developed like it had given me about sort of I don't know six or seven pages. So I said go one layer deeper, and it came up with about sort of sort of ten pages. And I can't remember the second thing I did, but um, uh, oh yes, I asked it to to improve its work. So I asked it to sort of check it over uh, and valid and validate what it could. Uh, and, and often giving it a second chance like that is often a good way of improving the, the quality mm-hmm. of something. And then I went, as we've been saying before, I, I changed model within the same conversation. And uh, I asked it to um, sort of look at the different, um, because for this particular strategy, what I'd done is I'd asked it to go to evidence-based research. So mm-hmm. O one one had actually worked, had worked out what was the most relevant bits of, of the, the research literature that's relevant to success factors for this type of project. Um, yeah, and, and for me, that was the most fascinating part of the incredible of this isn't experiment. It? Because you know, when you the first part of your experiment in terms of if, if I want to really be crude, which is give me a table of contents for a project execution yeah. strategy for a project like this, 
and then based upon the project definition document it, it, it then gave that second level of, of detail yeah. as to the things you do specifically for, for that project rather than a generic uh, execution strategy you could sort of do that with what we were looking at last year but it was when you then said and show me the evidence-based research yeah. as to what's critically important for this type of project based upon success factors <laughs> I, I i literally i i sort of sat back in my chair and went oh wow that that's now that's just a, a game changer again isn't it from being something that's moving it from being productive in terms of producing output to now being effective in terms of producing it, an output. It really output. is incredible. I mean, so you, you you could already do some of it. So one should have been doing this five years ago if, if one has time on a project, which one doesn't always have, where you do a, a literature search for, if you like, exactly this type of project. It's a bit similar to the sort of, you know, sort of project benchmarking idea, but mm-hmm. you can get, both the average project, if you like, so in other words, a project on this type and this tech sector, but you can also look to see if there's anything about the idiosyncrasies of the project, of the sort of the edge cases within the project. So, for example, I don't know, I mean, I remember a few years ago, I mean, one of the examples would be there's um, there's a really good paper by Locatelli and someone else on um, success factors for nuclear decommissioning projects. That's right. Yeah, um, we've got and a copyright paper in our uh, repository as well. So uh, yeah, right. I'm, I'm familiar with that paper. Uh, no, exactly. <laughs> and, but it's brilliant. So. so if you're doing a decommission, the first thing you should do is, uh, you know, whether or not you're an expert in that area or not, if you like, they've gone through like tens and tens of like decom projects and like worked out which ones were success factors associated with it. So what you could do three months ago is you could, if you like, attach that paper, if you knew, to, if you knew about that mm-hmm. paper, right? And you could say, right, write an execution strategy model based upon these success factors. And that was pretty good already. Okay, so that was already pretty good. But now this model can say, well, yeah, of course, I've reviewed. I mean, I know the literature. The model knows the literature. Some of the listeners may be a little incredulous at this. So I did an earlier experiment. I need to say something about an earlier experiment a week, like a couple of days before, where I'd asked a, a particular project question. Um, a sort of detailed project question and I asked it for 10 papers 10 key papers in that on that topic and it was not just a topic it was an intersection of topics right so it was um, and I checked every paper and they were all bang on topic so mm-hmm. so I give that that was how I could move on to this more advanced thing that I had the confidence that it would actually pull out the right sort of papers but then, then, so then what you could do is... So, yeah. so when you say pulling out those papers, these, these aren't papers that you've loaded into your model. Correct. Yourself. It's one of found these research papers. Correct. Because you prompted it by saying, give me evidence-based research that supports your answer. Correct. Now, and, it's and now this searching com- for things rather than making things up. Exactly. It's, just, things it, it's, it's incredible. I mean, it, for those that listened to, um, to, to our podcast last year, Andy... Um, there's a real specific reference in, uh, in there. So there's some continuity in there. And I do recommend people do listen to it because actually we are very much talking about the Delta, if you like, but, um, of mm-hmm. what's happened from a year before. So I think I still think that that podcast holds up. But there was a bit, Andy, where you and I were talking about how much do we need big data for projects and success with LLMs relative to knowledge and mm-hmm. small data and highly contextual data and I was saying there, my opinion, and it's just an opinion, is that often um, what you need is high value research that has gone through a data and evidence based process. But I'd rather, if you like, that research practitioners in project management have done that because they, they've gone through all the effort of actually sort of like, like sort of testing and validating that data. Um, and so that, then that knowledge is distilled in those papers from the, the, from the best papers. Um, and then what you need is small data. This is my opinion a year ago um, about a project or a portfolio or a program that's highly contextual and often no needs an expert to pull out what are the unique factors of the situation that means it's not just an urban renewal project, right? Mm-hmm. And often that's actually where you do need that project ex- that, that human project expertise. So that small data plus knowledge, in my opinion, often baits like big, big, big data. <laughs> You know, sort of taking your enterprise um, uh, SaaS, SaaS models and, and like dumping it in the LLM, and, and for me that that is a that is a step forward, you know, sort of indicating that maybe what I was saying before was was a reasonable guess about the trajectory, that that, that yeah. because it knows the literature, and that's that reasoning aspect yes. as well, where perhaps it's not looking at 
millions of cases and making it a statistical answer. It's actually doing some reasoning. So as you say, the, the need for the, the big data perhaps reduces when we're thinking about our major projects in the round rather than perhaps yes. you know, at, at the task level. So I think there's two bits about it. There's a bit that was was already true a year ago. And I think, again, if I say this, just to help like to consolidate people's intuitions about it, is people, some people have heard you, us talk about, people talk about embeddings, uh, which is, if you like, where different, um, where within the model, um, different concepts are stored. So you might have an embedding for an urban renewal project. You'll have an embedding for um, a particular type of um, energy or whatever and those all those concepts are in a high high dimensional space and they're they're all a long way from each other because it's a high dimensional space but even then some concepts are close together and even like a few months ago um the llm already has mapped out your concepts and, and your in your particular clever project area it's already got those concepts mm-hmm. all right and it already knows which other concepts are close to it um, and so it, you already get that, if you like, in the box. And so you're absolutely right, Andy, is that actually this is now the icing on the cake in that it's able to explore multiple possible branches of exploitation of that embedding that it's already got. So, for so, example, if we've got, if we're thinking about using critical chain on our project, yeah, um, it, it would perhaps understand that concept in relation to, say, how lean might be used in manufacturing exactly no, that's yeah. necessarily a direct relationship yeah. from one to the other but it would but understand those two two conceptual models but it, so it, it could do that before and now what it can do is when you say you can say reason about if you like um how much of this method do we want to use on this project relative to another method and mm-hmm. justify your answer O one one model it can now do that because it's so it's almost now it, i mean i'm not not to be anthropomorphic about it, but it's got that ability to reflect and iterate on the on the if you like the static knowledge that it has, which includes mm-hmm. those concepts. So it's able to do something. I mean, it's very different from what we do, but but it's increasingly something that we can at least recognise that's similar to a lot of us to a lot of our thinking practices, right? Where we go, okay, mm-hmm. here are three candidates for my methods for this this particular type of unusual thing. So don't underestimate an LLM now that it's a reasoning model as well. Again, it's reasoning in in sort of caption marks, okay? So because th- there's there's a lot going on which you can help you with. And what it can do is it can allow you to actually think about actually what is the question, you know, what are the difficult questions? Because mm-hmm. it can do the easy questions uh, and then you can just check them, right? So, yeah, what's not to like? Yeah, I heard a, an expression the other day where I put it up. So in AI, the hard things are easy, while the easy things are hard. <laughs> oh, that's a great statement yes. in terms of yeah. how we can think about where we can get it to do things that whether it's just because of the amount of information we would need to process, or or, or the time it would take us to do things to do that, and then we can then think about the hard decisions that we need to make based upon. Exactly. This output. So, um, and yeah. you can and you can now just one sentence on that. You can just do like you can, if you write a really good two liner as a prompt that says, mm-hmm. "I want you to think about these methods and these are the particular like unique things about this project." That's a really hard thing to do, but like good project managers can do that, right? That's why, yeah. that's why the good. And now you can like while you're literally thinking about your execution strategy, you can run this thing in parallel. And then there's, you're certain to have some, it will have some approaches that won't have occurred to you. So you can then go. Yeah, it's a bit like the the old adage that consultants aren't paid for the answers they provide, but the questions that they ask. Um, but Brilliant. Look, it's another yes. discussion for another yes. day, that one. Um, Lawrence, we talk about um, loading your documents into, yes. uh, or, or your content into the large language models uh, and the concept. I think last time we talked about it of customizable. GPT. Yeah. So, so we would take a generic, a general one, and we'll make it specific to, say, infrastructure projects yeah. or nuclear decommissioning. So we can we can give it specific context. And again, if I explain it, and you can correct me. Um, and then it's not just that we load this knowledge base into it, but we start to give it weightings in terms of things it would trust first or look at first before it then goes out to see what it can find elsewhere. It's that sort of a general concept of how we sort of 
customize or build specific yeah. versions of um, LLMs. Yes, uh, yeah, that's that, that's that's right. Um, the very specific that you mentioned about, if you like, interestingly, you've asked for a very hard thing. <laughs> yeah. uh, one in one bit of it, um, which I won't address now because it's slightly beyond my pay grade and it's a longer conversation. Um, but in terms of like sort of retrieval augmented generation, which obviously a lot of people will have heard of, which is the main way in which uh, these things are, are used, actually getting back the right search queries and how you prioritize that. That is, um, that's what a lot of like um, engineers have been working on furiously in the last year and that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Um, so yes, um, let me say a couple of things in this general area that might help your audience, if that could, in, in terms mm -hmm. of how it's moved on in a year. So I think the first big kind of division I would make is um, when you want to bring your documents in, uh, there's two main ways of doing that, right? So there's RAG, okay, which is where you essentially just upload the document um, uh, and like, so for example, with a custom GPT, that, that would do it. But, um, and then the second way is where you're doing, you're using those documents within something called in context learning. Mm -hmm. So that's where, and that you're even often doing that when you're uploading documents, depends on exactly where you're uploading those documents and whatever, but that's where you're doing, you're uploading those into the, in essentially alongside the prompt. So it becomes part of the prompt and um, both are powerful. So RAG will find you like very specific things. So if you want to know a particular type of clause that's related to this, it will go find that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in context learning, and I, I will say in a minute how to how to actually make best use of that right now because I think it's incredible and free to use. But in context learning is incredibly powerful for summarization and overviews and getting a sense of an entire discipline. Okay. Um, and because now, um, and here's one example, if you use sort of Gemini uh, 1.5 Pro uh, or even Flash, um, you are now can upload 2 million tokens. Um, and so, so let me give you an example. What um, do you mean by tokens, just to explain that? Yeah, a token is like a, often a little bit less than a word. So it's like divides it divides it up into, if you like, parts of speech. And that kind of thing. So just think of it as words, basically. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, an average novel is about eighty thousand words, right? Okay. <laughs> so you can upload twenty, you know, twenty, thirty books, no problem. Right. Okay. Before you've got the cap, is what you were yeah. saying earlier. <laughs> yeah, it's, okay. it's insane. Uh, and, and so let me let me give you, a, if you like, a worked example, which was one of the you know the mind blowing bits of my year. Uh, I went to a conference, which is really hard for me. It was a particularly hard conference this year. And I uploaded all the papers, all sort of sort of 70 papers I was interested in, and I asked it to give me an overview. And I could upload them all in one thing. I just uploaded them into, the, into Gemini because Gemini is better, at, has, has got all of the models can do this, but Gemini at the moment is in the lead if you want to do this kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And it told me, it I basically would say, right, well, tell, summarize the main developments that have been happening relative to other things in this field that are not new. So it was using its knowledge to go, well, which are the really clever new bits that are being being talked about at this conference? Okay. And it summarized it, it showed it gave me an order of say these this is the order in which you should this was a syllabus, if you like. You should read the papers in this order because mm -hmm. they make that's how the concepts build up. Okay. Um and it it wrote me an amazing summary. Uh it 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 projected forward. It said, and these are some of the most promising domains where if you, you bring these two papers together, it could do it. So that's, I mean, right. I'm not expecting, you know, the conference that's really is interesting. just so, so, so in powerful. addition to using it for project specific tasks, we, we can now use it to educate and train our practitioners in terms of these sort of reflective moments. As you said, it's giving yeah. you a topic saying, actually, here's a sequence in which you want to study it and learn it. Yes. And I guess you could even say, now give me a quiz <laughs> to test my yeah, knowledge. No, of it, it, exactly. So, and so I think, so really? that, so, and so people just aren't using that. And I think, you know, most things, you know, even if you're working 100% of your time on projects, um, most things, you know, over the years are not about one individual project. Again, mm -hmm. it's this thing about bringing together both knowledge and data. And so if you can do as it's like, um, you know, for, for the consultants on the on the call, we all know that if you've got a few days before you go into a client engagement, those last few those few days of reading 
and the, of thinking and, of, and of, of reviewing how you last went through a similar engagement and reading about the company and getting those questions right for the senior people uh, in that first week is mm-hmm. the most crucial bit often of the uh, of the thing. And you, so actually, that that's the time when you use something like this, not when you're mm. deep in delivery. But when you do have that breathing space, but to sort of come back, to come back to try and try just just wrapping up the answer to your question is so all of the models now sort of use RAG, but you're 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 better off using in in context, which is just uploading those documents into into the conversation that you're in, mm-hmm. okay, rather than creating a static database for many practical purposes. And you can do that on ChatGPT. Um, you could do that on Anthropics Claude. Um, and you can do that on, on Gemini, and you can also do that, obviously, with the open source models. So, Lawrence, one of the examples you posted on on LinkedIn, which yeah. um, I think it's one of my favorites, and I'm trying to work out why. <laughs> <laughs> but it was where, and actually, I think it's my favorite because it sort of probably sort of uh, reveals more about you than, than, than ChatGPT. <laughs> <your experiment. laughs> but, but it was the one where you, you used a model which had access to 90,000 of your uh, oh, yeah. uh, Kindle clippings. And I was, yes. first of all, it's a, probably always I liked it, the fact that you've got 90,000 Kindle clippings um, <laughs> <laughs> was an insight. Uh, and then you had another one where you'd uploaded 800 documents in relation to strategy and heuristics. Yeah. So you've got these two different uh, models, uh, and, uh, and whether exactly. they're sort of in context, but they've got different access to different things. One is a, uh, I guess the entirety of your your reading clippings, you said, oh, that's brilliant. I'll clip that and save that for later. And another one's very specifically around strategy and heuristics uh, around decision making. And you gave it a question, and they and you you gave it rules of engagement that these <laughs> two models could talk to each other on a turn by turn basis, and you oh. set them free. And, and I just thought, oh, what, what an awesome experiment! And and I would encourage every listener to to uh, yeah. we'll we'll provide the link again. Yeah. Click on that. Uh, and it was just, yeah, the, the fact that you've got these two you know, AI uh, engines talking to each other, but from a almost a different persona. One really? of a sort of a sort of a general knowledge, and another one uh, specifically around strategy. But uh, yeah, I mean, what what prompted you to come up with that experiment? And and have you have you done anything similar since? Yeah, I think there's. Thank you for digging deep enough to find that one. Um, that's what that's doing for the listeners. That that's using the uh, multimodal capabilities and the speech. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and as Andy's saying, that's using uh, this rag um, uh, with a number of documents. Um, and but by bundling those up, you can essentially get personas because uh, exactly as you're saying, Andy, you you can say if you like, this is your role, or this is these this is your temperament. Um, mm-hmm. And and also uh, you've got then these very different types of documents. As an aside, it's interesting that you bring this one up because it's useful for people to think that they may they may think that they've not got collected lots of things that they're interested in over the years, but they may well have done because those two sources were came from completely different ways of me interacting with 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 reading. Mm-hmm. So. So the Kindle one is absolutely zero effort in my part. It just means some of my books, so it just takes no effort just to kind of just draw a yellow, like like sticky over the thing. Uh, and mm-hmm. there's a little way in which you can actually get those clippings out. So um, uh, if people are interested, I can I can, I can share um, the, the details of that. But I mean, that, it's a bit fiddly, but take, but once you've got it, you've got the database of all those clippings. Um, the, there's then the strategy heuristics is a much more diff- is a different process where I've been reading sort of papers and and all that over the years. And, and I've did been... that include Art of War by Sun Tzu? <laughs> well, uh, yes, oh, just, um, yes, it's, it's, but but also so, you have to be careful with the GPTs. Oddly, on that one is that is that sometimes these older models that will be a, that can be a hallucination because I have noticed sometimes what it will do is it will choose something like Sun Tzu, which is in anyone's strategy and heuristics kind of bucket, yeah. and they'll use that. So um, it's easy for me to recognize what's uniquely in, in that. Anyway, but but the strategy heuristics one came from, now a lot of you have probably got this, right? Um, but you've got a filing system over the years of non-confidential stuff, which mm-hmm. is like articles that you've either read or, or like plan to read. Um, that is invaluable because you've actually curated that. That I mean, you might not think of it because it just might look like yeah, a kind of library. So, yeah, it's your personal yeah. library, and and some you have. 
I know sometimes you have a different, difficult relationship with that. One has a difficult relationship with that because because it brings up feelings of guilt or or, or uselessness because you've not read all the reading it or using it. So. But now, if you need to re- reframe that, if you don't get stuck in that, because think, well, hang on a minute, I haven't read all of these things, and I meant I meant to, etc. Um, now, because I've selected all of those ones, um, I can I can now put that into a model and and get it to, get it to either in a rag sense find a very specific thing right mm-hmm. uh, or i can in the in the in context learning sense i can get it to give me an overview of the particular things that i'm interested in and then go further in that direction so um so one particular one that it might i can find you the link andy um but another sort of follow on from that gpt talk it there's two different gpts with different documents and different personas talking that's, um, there's a series of seven posts, I think, where I do exactly that, but I do that for um, for the rail reform project um, in the UK. There's a rail reform project run by the DFT, mm-hmm. and and there's a lot of documentation online. And so I, I basically took the standard roles from all the documentation, and I basically gave the GPTs that, as well as all the all the program definition. And then I asked those I. I basically kicked off the program by, by 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 essentially asking the SRO to actually start talking with the program director um, and uh, and the sponsor and the, and then and then we had a series of meetings where the GPTs led where the custom GPTs led the meeting so, and it's just no, a bit of fun. But, it's a bit of fun, but it's a fantastic segue uh, on sort of the next topic I was going to bring up. But uh, I'm aware that uh, we normally limit these. Podcast for about 30 40 minutes, and we're, we're heading towards the hour. So, apologies, everyone, yes. if, you're, if you haven't sort of uh, take your dog uh, actually leap around the park, or if you're sat in a car park because you've already got to the train station or whatever. So, but but anyway, but what you've done there in terms of taking that sort of rail reform yeah. program, all the publicly available you know yeah. documentation, and, and you've sort of uh, set up your SRO, your program director, and so on. Um, am I right in what you've then done is you've effectively created agents that are interacting with themselves. So can you explain to those, we didn't really talk about agents last time round, but what are agents? Because that's something new, I think. Certainly in in, in sort of more prolific use than than when we were had our, our our last conversation. Yeah. So let's 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 call the proso agents for now, if you like, like sort of their their things in the direction of agents. Um, so agents will be things where they're given more a set of objectives or a set of a set of tasks and then they go off and and execute those and then come back to you and i think um sort of agents were big for the like for the for the first six months since we've we've spoken and then um there still were a lot of work going on but it's a little bit quieter andy um but but it's going to come back because some of it is requiring a lot more intensive development work but if i can cut to the if you like the the sort of near future on that there'll be two Two things going on. Um, I'm trying to give you the most sort of salient practical answers to mm-hmm. uh, on, on this particular one, Andy, because because we're getting close on time. There's going to be two types, of, and there already are to a certain degree. But there's there'll be two main modes of of operating um, that you're going to have in the next sort of excuse me, in the next six months to sort of two years. Um, one where you can basically WhatsApp a GPT, a custom GPT, which will actually be be essentially a full agent, and and it will go away. And come back when it's done what it's done, just like you would like use an, inter- an interim manager or something like that, so yep. more, more a consultant for a few hours. Um, and already you can do that now. Well, we will what there's capability there in, inherent in one zero yep. because you can allow it to because it will sometimes it thinks for 10 seconds, sometimes it thinks for like 50 seconds. Okay, now so in terms of your example of yeah. the SRO, the program director, and so yeah. on, so you could have, for example, a risk manager agent, and you could say, based upon everything that's been produced so far, give me an initial uh, risk management strategy and the initial risk register that we'll then take to a workshop, for example. Exactly, and and there, and in fact, why some of the some of the quite there's some quietness on this is because some platforms are already started, so they're already proto agents on other platforms. So there's something called u.com, for example, and there's po.com, where if you like, you can already choose a custom agent. I'm mm-hmm. still, because they're not got full agency at the moment, um, uh, I'm calling them proto agents. Um, and where you will be able to, tr- you know, you'll have a team 
and you'll have an advisor or a couple of sort of like worker type drones, if you like, um, uh, at all sorts of different levels um, on that WhatsApp group. And mm. like, and then, and those will, you know, including AIs, and you'll just be able to task that. Now, but there's two bits, so that's that's one use. That's one modality in which you'll be able to interact. I mean, you can do it now, but it will just get better and better and more and more yeah, popular. And, and interestingly, and then this will probably prompt another hour's discussion. But but good news is that the, the sort of some of the challenges you've got there in terms of these agents being in your WhatsApp group and. Some are being tasked with, say, doing yeah. uh, the risk, uh, the risk management strategy, is that there's a sort of ethical and governance challenges, which I guess is probably this. There's no longer really a technical issue, is it? It's a it's a governance and, and exactly and, 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 and how how much agency do we give to these? To these it's, ex- it's exactly it becomes a choice, and it will it is going to be very different to managing um, to managing people. Um, and so we're going to have to consciously adapt. But essentially, if it comes back to the risk report, now it's a bit like coming. It's a bit like receiving a risk report from someone who whose value you don't yet know and hasn't proven themselves, right? So you just read it a bit more carefully, right? No, but there's yes. a second. Yeah. There's a second modality. Uh, oh, sorry. If go I come shoot. to the uh, so, yeah, so yeah, we yeah. will be exploring this in in the, in the conference. So those who who are listening to this podcast ahead of attending our annual conference. Watch out for that for that session, but but I guess the challenge isn't just in terms of you say if someone that's given you the risk report and you don't know their background or their expertise and so on, so you perhaps read yeah. it a bit more carefully. But if it's when you've got agents interacting with agents, is this? And again, I'm going to use a term that I'm hopefully I'm using it in the right way, but I've heard that the term agentic workflows. But if we're getting agents talking to agents, I guess that's when we could get into trouble. Um. There are certainly safety implications to that, absolutely. But in terms of in terms of governance, then you can. I mean, it, it's it's at least analogical to how we have, you know, sort of different layers of of subcontractors. Uh, you know, some of whom are only used for like half a day on something or or an advisor. Um, let me let me just because some people will like that. There is another mm-hmm. modality that is coming. It was already here and blew my socks about a month ago. Um, because some people will want to be more hands on. So if you if you're busy and you like to just look at results and you and you trust yourself able to review that, then you you'll like that former, you know, just you know, task the agent in a WhatsApp, right? Um, there's another modality where you can actually task an agent um, and watch it work mm-hmm. and um, replit. There's something called Replit, uh, which is essentially you can code and deploy code as websites online. It's called uh, R-E-P-L-I-T. Um, but Replit has got agents now, and, I, and it is an, it's just a weird experience, but it's very exciting, right? So let me just tell you what I did, but the um, very very briefly. But the thing the thing about it that blew my socks wasn't just that it could do the thing that I, I told it to do. Um, it's that I'm watching it write the code like like a hundred times faster than I Mm -hmm. write code, right? Uh, And I'm watching it think. So it's giving me this dialogue and I can interrupt it anytime I like and say, oh, no, that's not right. Or I don't like that. Um, Or how about that? Or if I've had a new thought, I'd say, I actually need this feature. All right. And it will come back and it will present options to you. So that is a different modality. Let me just because just very say briefly about what it did so that you can get a sense of the sorts of things that you can be done now, all right, with literally $10 a month. Um, but I asked it to create a website to um, assist someone making decisions, um, um, and I gave it a decision ontology. Think of a structure for how to make decisions, okay? Mm-hmm. So um, you, th- those are just big doc- – so you can have documents that are ontologies, and I just gave it the ontology, and I said – sort of um, walk someone through a decision, helping them and structuring it and recording it using this ontology as a structure. And it just did it. It created it created an app that's on, on, on the web where it walks through a, a compl- complex decision and asks you your reasons and then asks you um, where you got this, et cetera. And then it comes up and it writes up and it's, as a decision tree. All right. And, and it, but, the, the amazing bit is not the capability that you could do that, because I kind of knew it could do that. The amazing bit is watching that agent go away and do it. And so some people, you can just tell. 
because and it's true for me like some things i don't want to know the details it's just like go and mm-hmm. try and get that thing done or evaluate it when you when you've done it right some things i'm like no you need to do it in this way and you need to, you need to understand this factor uh, uh and and you can now you can do both so that will be the other modality and there'll be a lot of people that will want to go that way and watch it watch the so you can click in the black box that's an agent and watch it doing its thing and if you like say oh, i want more of this and less of this and it will do it um or you can just get the black box giving you an answer at the end and justifying its answer mm-hmm. so so yeah that's you know that those are the options that are going to be available to you so lawrence i'm going to um try and wrap this up if, if we can so uh, um because there's just so much has happened since we last last spoke and the sort of the the, the direction of, of of travel is uh, i think uh, amazing but it's the pace of of, of uh, how we're going along that journey just seems to be accelerating and accelerating but but it, in, in a couple of your posts you, i think there's a collection of them you did about thinking about the impact on project work uh, and yeah. on project organisations, and you sort of uh, put together a bit of a manifesto uh, for how we might respond to that. You know, that I think that's a term that you use where you sort yeah, of put yeah. different target operating models that we might need to put in place as we go through these generations of of, uh, of capability. And you talk in there about sort of the the AGI, which is the artificial general intelligence, you yeah. know, might be upon us sooner than we thought. And then you talk also about ASI, which is the artificial superintelligence, so it's very specialised, I guess. Um, it sounds but, a bit bonkers, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. But when those things come in place, our target operating models. If you're a consultancy firm or or a client organisation or a project owner, you know, you know, could could well be different. So uh, I don't want to delve into that now because no. that's probably a different uh, podcast conversation altogether. But but if uh, if I can just ask you to uh, sort of some final thoughts in terms of where we are today. What should our listeners, what, what what should the project professionals be doing? You know, how do they get yeah, themselves yeah. ready for the change that's yeah. well, available to them now, but also uh, where it might be heading? Great question. Um, yeah, I'll whip through just a, f- a few things very quickly. So firstly, on AGI via ASI, it all sounds very sci-fi, um, and it may well be, all right? But mm-hmm. there's a useful distinction between AGI and ASI, okay? So AGI is when, when these when or if these models, if you like, are essentially capable, uh, as capable as the average human that's doing that job, mm-hmm. okay? Um, and then there's ASI, um, if and when it manages to bootstrap itself and actually be better, okay? So, and, and no one really knows for sure if, if we're just going to get capped at AGI. But there's there's a key moment when you get close to AGI, and we, let's face it, we're getting a bit closer to it, that w- when actually um, you can, where your business mo- you will need a business model for how to operate in a world which feels like the AGI is more or less there. Mm-hmm. And then that is qualitatively different from model when and if like ASA comes. So it's trying to disambiguate like the possible futures. Okay. And and just one reason of why it's worth thinking about that. I know this has just, just been your distant planning and that kind of thing. But if you listen to people like Shulman, um, and 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 others at OpenAI, they talk quite matter of factly about the point when AGI is reached in terms of when an when a when an intelligence is better or mm-hmm. uh, than like the average person on an average task. Okay, for for many tasks and um, um, as as being you know it could be from eighteen months to sort of sort of three years. That is some of them are talking in those that's sort of like, time frames. That's almost today, isn't it? In real terms, if you think about our strategic planning horizons that we're working to. That, yeah. That's, it, that's it, before the end of most organizations' strategic plan. Well, exactly. <laughs> and so, you, you know, yeah. even if you only rate it as like 1% likely, it's probably, you know, then at least put 1% of effort into thinking about that area. And it's just mm. giving you an extra term. I mean, just as John Shulman, who was a co-founder who went just from, of OpenAI, he just went to Anthropic. But in, in, in that podcast, he was then asked, he, he was saying similar remarks to this, but he, he, he was then asked, when will his job be replaced? And he was saying something oh, more like four to five years. So in other words, when it gets good enough, that, <laughs> that it, could, it could co-found uh, one of, anyway, so just, but anyway, let's, let's move on from that. Or we scare ourselves too much. But it's, yeah, it's just yeah. It, in the last year, a lot of people have essentially established their sensor networks uh, for, for AI adoption. 
Mm -hmm. And that's a big step. So people are looked at, so they know now which people, if, if certain people start paying attention to the next big thing in AI, they're much more attuned to it. Okay, so now, and, and now they've just gone back to their day job because they've got their sensor work out, out and, they, and they'll hear much more quickly when the next new thing happens. And I think that's fine for many people. Um, so let me just, couple, a couple of things then. Another, one very practical thing uh, that brings uh, is, I would say, use Gemini for long context at the moment, all right? Mm-hmm. So use it when you've got those hundreds of documents and you want it to kind of get an overview. We haven't talked about Claude Sonnet 3.5, which is on Anthropic, okay? But I would say I would use that because um, for generating mini apps that will work straight away and that you can share with someone to communicate, okay, um, that is a really powerful thing. And you can create something that will communicate something or do something. Um, like you could create a stage gating app, like in 30 mm-hmm. seconds. Um, uh, I would use Claude Sonnet for that. Uh, all right, and I would le- I would use GP- GPT four O, so the older model, for speaking and multimodal, mm-hmm. and for being able to like switch between speech and image, uh, and to- and and for the talking and that kind of thing, and then for the more difficult stuff, I would use one zero, because and then explore how get used to thinking about how am I going to work with a reasoning agent with, with not an agent but with a reasoning model. Because it's very different, I'll tell you right now, it's very different because like in, in the GPTs I was writing, the custom GPTs we all took about last year, I was giving it a series of steps. I'd say, do this, and they'd be often eight to ten steps. Now, that is not how you interact with 1.0. Mm-hmm. It's you know, it's like dealing with a much more senior person because you, you you don't because it might have a better it will have a, it will work out a series of steps. Um so, that, so that's another thing. I just leave it with in term I think the biggest single thing I can say about how companies projects are going to change relative rel- irrespective of how 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 much better this stuff gets even if we just end up where we are now even if it just flatlines as to where we are now um there's a there's an amazing paper called ai in the knowledge economy it came out about in april but it had this and it, it did a lot of work at saying how, how this will influence operating models but the simplest way just to think about it is that that if you think about managers and workers Okay, just to be reductive mm-hmm. for a second, um, then the economics of it works such that AI will will replace your worst workers, right? Mm-hmm. So, so wherever an AI is better than the, your worst worker, that that trend that that will happen. Now, unfortunately, that means some people will exit the market, okay, or but be reasoned to do other things. Hopefully, hopefully, mm-hmm. um, and then with managers. It's the same thing, but it could cause something different. So, so wherever you've got your manage, wherever you've got a manager, the the the, the worst managers will be replaced by AIs. And so, there's mm-hmm. two different types of dis- substitution. So, I mean, I can't go through all the reasoning why it explains what, why that, but there are some takeaways to it. Okay, that will just help, just give you a sort of shape to ha- how this is likely to pan out and is already panning out. Firstly, and this is already happening, that the first of those, the worker things, it already means that that um, good workers will become managers mm-hmm. because they can substitute and tell the work the AI worker what to do. Okay, and then with the with the managers, okay, then some some of them are going to have to learn some of the worst managers. It's not a qualitative thing; it's not a judge, value judgment, but um, some of the some of the worst managers. Uh, if you are worse at that than an AI, I know this sounds crazy and insane, but that you, your productivity may actually continue to improve, providing you're willing, in that case, for the AI to become a manager or your manager. So I guess the, the parallels there would be use of AI in cars. In terms of the worst drivers, will be improved when they've got AI safety mechanisms in in the car. Exactly. So, so, so it's but the, the the mental framing that has got me a long way is is remember that there's two of these fund two fundamentally different ways of working alongside AI. Sometimes you will be telling the AI what to do if you know better mm-hmm. than the AI what to do, and the AI will do it, and you will review it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And sometimes, and in some companies, 
then the the AI will be one of the better lower managers, mm-hmm. and uh, and and they will be essentially setting out and doing the reviews and doing uh, and identifying those tasks and reviewing those tasks of the work. And like a lot of people are I thinking in one frame and not the other. You need to think in both, and it's horses for courses. So. So that's one of the ways to. I mean, there's a lot more to say about that, but if you like, um, it's an incredible paper. I'll, I'll send the send you the link if. Yeah, uh, so that's fantastic, Lawrence. So that's the AI in the knowledge economy. Um, yeah. Economy. I, okay, we'll we'll yeah. provide links to that. Sounds like something that we all ought to read quite soon, uh, if we're, you're not done so already. So I'm going to wrap it up there. So um, thanks as always, Lawrence. And uh, my reflection here is uh, twofold. One that uh, I, I guess I'm guilty of this. I, I mostly use the, the chat GPT when I'm you know, experimenting and thinking of using generative AI or large language models in, in what I do. But, but you're saying, actually, no, you use that either 4.0 or 01, depending upon what you want to do. But you could also use Gemini and Claude Sonnet and so on. And I, you know, so that's my takeaway from today, that I might need yeah. to be using different models for different things rather than think of it all as just one one bucket of uh, chat gpt so so thank you for that uh, and then secondly obviously the the last conversation about how we might need to uh, to change but but i think what i've mostly learned from this is that one year is too long between our discussions in this topic and uh, perhaps we need to have you back as a as a more regular guest on our podcast perhaps every three or four months uh, just to get a, a snapshot as to what has changed so uh, Thank you very much once again, Lawrence, and uh, apologies for the, the duration of this one, but we just had so much uh, to, to, to get through. So that's it for this episode. For those of you who are attending our annual conference uh, in October, really look forward to seeing you there. And hopefully today's conversation has whetted your appetite as to the art of the possible, uh, some of the concerns and uh, where we might be heading. So uh, look forward to seeing you then.